Planet Earth is a world of wonders. Many of Earth's wonders that always draw gasps of amazement and admiration are the awesome creations of nature. They include the iconic Three Sisters Rock Formation and the spectacular Great Barrier Reef in Australia, the plunging fjords of Fiordland in New Zealand, the astonishing Grand Canyon in America, the immense Great Rift Valley of Africa, or the many other breathtaking famous sites scattered around the world. However, equally impressive are the Earth's man-made wonders. Throughout history, the world has been made a more pleasant place to live in by great artists, sculptors, and other people of creative genius. Our planet has a rich store of magnificent architectural and engineering masterpieces created by people over thousands of years. We can still admire the great pyramids of Egypt, the huge Colosseum of Rome, the exquisitely beautiful Taj Mahal of India, the awesome Tower of London, and the incredible skyscrapers of New York, which create one of the world's finest skylines. When contemplating these man-made wonders, we're filled with admiration and astonishment at the human genius behind these marvelous creations. Today, we're going to consider the mastermind behind them all, the source of this human genius, a true wonder of wonders, the human brain. Every one of these man-made wonders had its origin in a human brain. In fact, without the human brain, none of them would exist. Join me on a journey to explore the amazing and mysterious world inside your head. It may just enhance and enrich your life, put an extra spring in your step, and remind you that there's nothing at all ordinary about you. Lucky you! If you're watching this program, you're in possession of one of the most sophisticated and complicated objects in the known universe. Now, it isn't much to look at, but it's what allows us to experience the world. It allows us to communicate, create art, and fly to the moon. It's the mastermind behind all the creativity and genius that's produced the greatest man-made wonders of the world. It is, of course, the human brain. Now, consider this for a moment. How does a 1.4 kilo or three pound blob of gray matter between our ears, a tangle of nerve cells, allow us to sense, understand, and change our lives and our world? How does it support thought, memory, creativity and consciousness? What is our brain made of? What happens when it goes wrong? How can I protect and care for it? Have you ever wondered what's going on inside your head? It's been said that you can manage something effectively only when you can identify, label and describe it. How does one do that with the brain? Well, today's guest, a brain function specialist, can help us figure this out. Dr. Arlene Taylor is the founder and president of Realizations Inc., a nonprofit corporation that engages in brain function research and provides unique educational resources. The author of several popular books related to brain function and practical applications to relationships and everyday living and creator of the Longevity Lifestyle Matters program. Dr. Taylor speaks internationally. Dr. Taylor, welcome to The Incredible Journey. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here to talk with you about the brain. I've never heard someone talk about meeting your brain before. You must have a reason for thinking that people should meet their brain. I definitely do. Let's start with a quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes. He thought the brain was so important 
that the primary function of the body was just to carry the brain around. And very few people meet their brain. You and your brain are the only two entities that will be together for your entire life. And although the brain is way past the average computer, you can use that computer analogy in that if you don't, if you haven't met your computer, if you don't know how your computer works, you are not going to be able to use it by design. And therefore, you're going to lose a lot of your effectiveness. So there are several reasons that I tell people, your brain is so unique. You need to learn about it. You need to meet it. So what are some of those reasons? Well, first, if you meet your brain, you're going to have a better shot at using it by design because you're going to know some of the research about how it works best and how it works not so effectively. You're going to have a smoother ride through life. You know, if you have two vehicles that look almost identical, one's automatic and one's stick shift, and you don't know the difference, and you try to get into the stick shift vehicle and drive it like an automatic or vice versa, you're going to have a bumpy ride. So if you start using your brain the way it was designed to be used, you'll have a smoother ride. You need to learn something about how to keep it safe, what things are bad for it, what things actually destroy cells, what can you do to, work, to keep it working effectively. You can enhance, enhance your communication with yourself and then with everybody else. And finally, my goal is to stay healthier and younger for longer. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that is to understand as much as I can about my brain and about the research that tells me how I can keep it functioning that well. Let's say you're talking to someone for the first time and they're interested in their brain. What do you tell them? That sort of depends on the context, you know, their age and things like that. But what I like to start out with is to say, everything starts in your brain. Everything. Everything. Plus, your brain is unique. There's only one brain like yours on the planet. There's never been another one like it. There will never, ever be another one like it. This is it. Everything you think feel, see, hear, touch, choose to do, has to be processed through this three-pound organism, if you want to call it that. In addition, every thought you think actually changes some of the pathways in the brain. And so we actually become more different and unique as we get older because nobody ever thinks identical thoughts. Because of this, you are special. You have something no other brain has exactly like you do. And unless you identify that and use it, you have deprived the universe, the entire universe, of something that only your brain could offer. Dr. Taylor, how do you suggest we go about meeting the brain? Well, let's start with a little bit about what it looks like. Your brain is about the size of your two fists held together like this. This particular brain model would be for someone who's, who is much larger than I am because their fists would be much larger. Uh -huh. So your brain is the size of these two fists. Now imagine that you put a gray glove on your left hand and a whitish glove on your right hand. And that's about the color differences between the two brains. When you do the, the gray glove and the white glove metaphor, how come the, the right one is white? And that's because there's a difference in function between the two hemispheres, although in the normal, healthy, functional brain, they work together all the time. But the right hemisphere actually has more white matter in it. The long 
pathways, nerve pathways that are wrapped with insulation, myelin, mm -hmm. to help you think more quickly. Yes. And since there's more of those white fibers in the right side of the brain, it looks whiter. It's pretty basic. Simple. The other thing is the brain can be described as three functional layers. Paul McLean started talking about three brain layers and his colleagues were not impressed. In fact, he was pretty well ostracized for many years by the medical community. And then guess what? We got some brain imaging equipment. We got new ways to evaluate the brain. And you can talk about the brain as three functional layers. So Here's a metaphor for the three layers of the brain. And I think this is something that people need to meet about their brain. If you think of your wrist as the first brain layer, there's no conscious thought there. There's a lot that happens in this part of the brain, but it's not the cognitive part in the third layer. So this, your, your wrist is the first layer. Make that hand into a fist. Now you have the second brain layer. Mm -hmm. It's called the limbic system. Again, subconscious, but a lot goes on there. It's the home of emotional impulses, which I find interesting because it's also the relational part. It's the part that wants a relationship. And that part comes out of a subconscious part of the brain. So no wonder we mess up with relationships so much. So we need to make sure they're all working together. Now take your other hand, put it over the top like an umbrella. And there's the third brain layer called the neocortex or cerebrum or gray matter. There's lots of names. In this part of the brain, there is some conscious thought. Only part of the brain that has any conscious thought. Don't get too excited about that because research suggests that maybe 15 to 20 percent, if you're lucky, of what goes on in this part of the brain comes to conscious awareness. So part of meeting your brain is staying perceptive and aware of what's going through your mind and trying to bring more of it to conscious awareness because you can only manage what you can identify label, and describe. We often hear people talk about the brain as if it's a living computer. Is that just a euphemism or a metaphor? Or does the brain actually resemble a computer? The brain has a number of critical functions. When computers were built, they can do some of the functions that a brain can do, but not all of them. There are some ways that the computer and the brain are similar. For example, they both need an energy source. You know, you plug into some type of electrical current for a computer, but the brain needs glucose, enzymes, oxygen, all kinds of things. Secondly, you have to boot it up. And when I turn my computer on in the morning, I'm booting it up. Well, you have to boot up your brain as well. How do you boot it up? Well, for one thing, you can do some deep brain breathing when you first wake up. You can eat a really good breakfast to give it some fuel because it's been, uh, what would you say, not starving all night, but it's been giving your digestive system a break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can do some exercise. That's, that's how you boot up your brain. So that, that's, that, those are really practical suggestions that we can all take note of and, and implement in our and lives. And we need to do that. Third... Both the brain and computers are susceptible to viruses. Different kind of viruses, granted. But you can get such a lethal virus in a human being that it can just kill the brain. And you can get a virus in your computer to shut down your computer. So it's really important to have viral protection yes. for your computer, yes. but also to do things yeah. that can protect the brain. Four, both of them work better when they're cool. If a computer gets too hot, it can get fried. And if you get sick and your temp body temperature rises too quickly, that can kill the brain as well. Now, there are computers that can do some things faster than the human brain. 
certain mathematical computations, for example. But as far as I know, there's no computer on this planet that can do the type of creative, sophisticated, abstract thinking that is done by the human brain. So it's a, it's a, marvelous, a marvelous organism. Some call it the most amazing piece of biological real estate, not just on this planet, but in the known universe. Dr. Taylor, I've heard perhaps on a television ad something to the effect that the brain is developed by the age of three, three years of age. Is that really true? Well, it's probably true. However, that is not mature. So developing is one thing, being developed. Being mature is an entirely different concept which is why even though the brain is is developed, a three-year-old cannot do high-level cognitive thinking because the prefrontal cortex isn't even done yet. The corpus callosum, here's the kind of way of the brain, just like we did the wrist, the fist, and the other hand over it. Here is that first layer, brain, stem, and cerebellum. Here is that mammalian layer, here is the neocortex. Do you see this? Mm -hmm. This is the largest of the three or four or five bridges that connect these two hemispheres. This is almost like if, if you cracked a walnut out of the shell and got it out whole and pulled this apart a little bit and imagined that there were the bridges connecting them, it's very much like a walnut. The... Corpus callosum is not paved. Those long axons are not wrapped completely with myelin until about age 20 or 21. And until that happens, I say that the brain is um, at risk of shorting out at any particular time. It, you're going down a highway and you hit a pothole or there's a patch of gravel or something like that. So until this is paved, you don't have really continuous interaction at a, at a quality level or at a, at a predictable, consistent level. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. Right here, behind your forehead, which is part of this third layer, neocortex, the prefrontal cortex, where you have those executive functions, planning, willpower, morality, choosing, so on and so forth. That's not done until mid to late 20s. And in many cultures, we push the brain so quickly to grow up. And we expect that a 17-year-old is going to have the cognitive capacity of a 27-year-old, and when they don't, we punish them and say, how come you're so dumb? Well, you can only do what the brain is developed to do. So it's important to understand that many people make life-impactful decisions before this is done. You know, I had a girlfriend, she got married at 15, had her first child at 17, had one at 18, had one at 19. Her corpus callosum wasn't even done yet. And by the time she was about 28 and her prefrontal cortex was done, she calls me on the phone and she says, Arlene, I woke up this morning and I looked around the house and I said to myself, what are all these people doing here? Because if I was making the decision now, as much as I love them, none of them would be here, not even the dog. Because the life impactful decisions were made who you think you want to wake up next to every day for the rest of your life at 17 can be light years away from who you, who you really want to wake up to every day for the rest of your life when you're 27, 28, or 29. Dr. Taylor, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to have you on the incredible journey today. Thank you for being with us and sharing such practical and relevant information. You're so welcome. Well, Dr. Taylor has certainly reminded us 
that our brains are something special, truly marvellous. And when you think about it, it's just mind-blowing to realise that sitting on your shoulders is the most sophisticated and complex object in the known universe. The brain's memory capacity is about a quadrillion bytes, the same amount needed to store the entire internet. Our brain is capable of over 1,000 processes per second. It makes us who we are and controls everything we do. And yet, it weighs less than one and a half kilos and could fit into your hand. No wonder the psalmist exclaimed this to God in the Bible book of Psalms. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. The brain, the human body and all its intricacies is just too wondrous, too wonderful, too awe-inspiring for David to remain silent. As he contemplates the wonder of it all, he's overwhelmed and he exclaims, wow, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And he's spot on, absolutely right. We're not the product of chance or haphazard construction. At the beginning of the Bible, it tells us how everything was originally made. Here's what it says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it continues to list what God made on each of the six days of creation. And at the end of each day, when God surveyed His work, He commented that it was good. So everything God created on each of those days was good. Day, night, sky, atmosphere, land, sea, vegetation, sun, moon and stars, sea life, birds, animals. God said that they were all good. But now notice what happens next in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. After God had created us humans, I'd like you to notice what he said here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Before creating human beings, God had already created everything else in the world and it was good. But when he created human beings, God looked over what he'd made and said it was very good. In other words, we are more than just good to God. We are very good to God. We were made in the image of God and he highly values each and every one of us. In fact, we are the pinnacle of everything he created. We are God's masterpiece. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. You're not average. There's nothing ordinary about you. You've been custom made. You are God's masterpiece. In you, God made something special, something very good. You are a masterpiece of exquisite and unique design. You are God's most prized possession. You're extremely valuable to God and He has a purpose and plan for your life. He loves you and wants to be with you forever, for all eternity. Here's what the Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Dr. Taylor has reminded us that our brains are something special, truly marvellous. And when you think about it, it's just mind-blowing to realise that sitting on your shoulders is the most sophisticated and complex object in the known universe. Our brains also remind us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
and that we are God's masterpiece. If you want true happiness and inner peace, if you want to see yourself the way God sees you and experience all that He has for you, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's the booklet, Simple Ways to Boost Your Brain. If you want to know ways to improve your brain's power, then this booklet is for you. It's our gift to you and is absolutely free. I guarantee there are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the gift we have for you today. Here's the information you need. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand. Or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. That's right, you can have today's offer completely free of charge and with absolutely no obligation. So don't delay. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand. Or visit our website or simply scan the QR code on your screen to request today's free offer. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia. Or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey to the last great frontier, the human brain, and our reflections on God's masterpiece, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's pray to the God who created us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life and for making us in your image. Thank you for making us your masterpiece and giving each one of us such a marvellous brain and all of the abilities it gives us. Thank you for giving us everything we need in life, here and for eternity. We accept Jesus and invite him into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen.